Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Captain Roger Hill, a veteran of the U.S. Army and a veteran of the Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. He is also the author of the new book, Dog Company, a true story of American soldiers abandoned by their high command. The book tells the story of his legal battle with the U.S. military over the steps he took to protect his company from the Taliban and their informants who are working with and around members of Dog Company. And Captain, it's an honor to have you in studio. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, pleasure's all mine. Thank you. Let's start at the beginning. Where were you born and raised? Uh, wow, okay. So <laughs> uh, Lexington, Kentucky was where I was born and raised all over. My dad was military, so we lived in any number of places. But where I kind of call home is northeast Alabama, a county called Jackson County, Alabama. What branch was he in? He was in the Army as well. He was an infantryman just like me. When did you join the service? 2000 is when I was commissioned out of West Point. Um, of course, I was there four years prior to start at the academy. It's because you wanted to follow, follow in your father, father's footsteps? I think I knew uh, probably around the age of five or six. I went to a training exercise and we were able to, the families were able to sit in the bleachers and kind of observe uh, an operation, you know, uh, at night. And I think I just kind of knew at that point in time with all the sights and the sounds and the smells that it's probably what I wanted to do. So you graduate from West Point in 2000. Obviously, about a year and change later, we have 9-11. How does that affect you? Um, yeah, it got very real very quickly. Yeah, so um, a lot of my friends were sent over right away. Um, the infantry, of course, is one of the first to go. Um, I went some number of years later to Iraq and then, of course, uh, Afghanistan uh, in 2008, 2009. Talk about those earlier deployments first. Uh, what where were you sent? What unit were you with? Sure. I started off in Korea with 1-9 Infantry. I uh, was stationed out of a place called Camp Hovey, just south of the DMZ. That was a mechanized infantry unit. Then uh, went stateside, worked for the Old Guard here in uh, D.C. in Arlington. Um, was privileged to serve in any number of ceremonies uh, and honors. Actually played a role, and uh, one of my biggest honors was uh, playing a role as the, uh, the Guard of Honor OIC for President Reagan's internment. Wow. Super, yeah, super cool. Learned a lot about him, fell in love with him and, and his legacy during that time. Uh, did a lot to shape my values as a, an American citizen, as a person. Uh, after that, I went to go teach at the Infantry Officer Basic Course down at Fort Benning, Georgia. Did that for a couple of years. Left there to go to Iraq and serve as a combat advisor. I fought alongside the Peshmerga of the Kurdish people. Uh, fought just south of Mosul, all the way down to Ramadi, just before the surge in 2006 and 7. Uh, saw heavy combat there. Uh, went back stateside. I taught a little bit longer. Took those lessons learned and tried to impart them into the next class of uh, second lieutenants coming into the infantry. And then after Fort Benning, uh, over to the 101st Airborne Division, where I served as the company commander for Dog Company. Let's go back to Iraq for just a moment. Uh, when you talk about fighting alongside the Peshmerga, uh, around Mosul, down to Ramadi, talk about those operations. What was it like, first of all, collaborating with uh, some of the indigenous forces there? An unbelievable experience. Uh, my time in Korea, I got to work some with the Korean military, um, but that was, of course, in peacetime. Um, but working with another culture and another people, building uh, friendship at that very base level where you be almost become family because you're with each other so often and you don't have family of your own to go back to at the end of the day. Those guys are it day in and day out. It was just uh, an unreal and just such a satisfying and uh, rewarding experience. Was it pretty easy to get in sync with, with the Peshmerga? It was. Uh, I, I think as far as the Middle East goes, they've got to be one of the most professional um, warrior classes you know, in the Middle East. And so uh, I think given the type of professionalism that our military espouses to, it was easy for us to work together, see eye to eye, and conduct operations together. And who were you fighting at that point? Is this during the insurgency? Uh, yeah. Which factions were in the way there? Yeah, so that was 2006, seven, And yeah, certainly this was when the insurgency in Iraq was kind of at its height. So um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, the Sunni extremist sect of Al-Qaeda, um, which was formerly the, uh, the Ba'athist party that we had removed from power when we toppled Saddam Hussein's uh, government. Uh, those are the guys, the hardcore regime that was left over uh, that we we're dealing with at that time. Of course, there was a lot of influence from Iran at the time as well, a lot of IEDs being transported over the border and used against us. So it's, as you know, very complex. Um, but without getting into all that, yeah, those are kind of the two basic elements that we dealt with. And what type of 
development did you see in yourself at that point? Because uh, you've done so much in terms of teaching and training, and when you actually get uh, onto the battlefield, what was it like? Yeah, so I was uh, in in that capacity as a combat advisor. I advised the operations officer who does the planning for the operations and then oversees and then goes out and helps manage the operation at a battalion level. And of course you get pushed down to lower levels based on who the main effort is within that battalion so that you can help steer them towards their objectives in the most efficient and optimal way possible. Um, teaching and then actually doing what you taught really helps hone those skills. So I um, really uh, began to hone my craft in terms of being an infantry officer. All infantry officers are operations officers when it comes down to it. So I, I, my development, my professional development at that time really grew uh, through that experience. I was very thankful for it. So then you come home, I'm guessing, and that's when you received command of Dog Company of the 101st? Yeah, I went back to Fort Benning. I taught again at the Infantry Officer Basic Course, um, was able to bring those lessons learned from fighting next to the Kurds, fighting a, a, a very difficult counterinsurgency, um, and then uh, what we call a change of station in the military. Uh, went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky to serve for the 101st, first as an assistant operations officer for a battalion, and then was slipped into a company command just before we went to Afghanistan. And from the materials I read in connection to your book, uh, the unit, when you got command of it, was not exactly in, uh, in the best shape. What were some of the challenges you had to deal with? There were um, some previous leadership challenges, um, and I think just morale maybe had suffered a little bit just because of the folks that were in charge of that organization, not necessarily at the company level, but, um, well, yeah, without getting into it, because I don't want to disparage anybody, but there were some leaders that were in place at that time that maybe helped morale suffer. Um, but uh, the, the challenges uh, were more uh, in the way of transitioning these guys who had seen and dealt with a very kinetic environment in Iraq to transition them to what we thought was going to be um, a, a more um, textbook counterinsurgency to win the hearts and minds and rebuild in Afghanistan. Of course, when we got to Afghanistan, it was a very kinetic environment, but um, trying to transition that company to that mindset was really sort of the, the crux of that challenge at that time. Um, I was certainly thankful that they were um, had had all of the, the, the hard combat that they had had in Ramadi because we leaned on it more than anything once we got to Afghanistan, for sure. How, so how do you go about trying to refocus their mindset? Um, really no differently than um, how I did it when I was an instructor. I mean, you just kind of get back to the basics of what it takes to be successful in a counterinsurgency type campaign. Um, it's, it's a lot of uh, just distilling down to basic points of what your objectives are. And our NCO Corps, our enlisted uh, men and women of the United States Army uh, are head and shoulders above any other fighting force in the military. They're really kind of an end state up front type of group where you can just tell them what you want to achieve and they'll find a way to get there. So it's, it's not, um, it wasn't so much of a difficult challenge, you know, to, to bring that message to them and for them to execute and, and get on board. It was just a matter of communicating effectively what we wanted to see out of them once we got overseas. And they were brilliant at it. How long did, did you have to turn it around? Um, and again, I, I don't want to use uh, the language of turning around. It wasn't like these folks needed a, a lot of shepherding. Transition time, I guess. Yeah, um, we, we probably could have used more time. Um, the op tempo at that time was very difficult in that we were constantly rotating people over to Iraq or Afghanistan. Prematurely, we would often send units over with less than um, the combat strength needed to fill like a full battalion or a full brigade footprint. So I think when we first went over to Afghanistan in 2008, we sent, our battalion was sent over at about 75, 80% strength. So when you ask how long did it take, we didn't have enough time. Um, we did the best we could with the time that we had. Yeah. You were deployed to Wardock province? Yeah, is that how you very say good, that? very good, yeah. Um, tell us about that part of Afghanistan and, and what your general mission was there. Yeah, so Wardak is uh, just south of Kabul just north of Ghazni, two major city centers, uh, Kabul of course being the, the government uh, center capital of the country, um, also known as um, RC East, Regional Command East, under the, the theater level command, um, Wardak was in Regional Command East out of the four regional commands, uh, north, south, east, and west. Uh, the eastern part of the country, as you know, very violent, uh, very difficult, dy dynamic, very complex environment. So, yeah, uh, we, we got sent into a very uh, hot area, if you will, from the start. And 
where did you generally engage? Uh, was it just on, on patrols? Did you have a, a general objective during your tour there? What was the, 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 the larger picture? Yeah, so interestingly, when we came in uh, initially, and in, in it's sort of a part of our intelligence preparation prior to going to the area, we were told by the previous unit that this area was um, considered a, a peaceful province, a model province for Afghanistan. Uh, they had had a, a non-government organization, NGO, sponsored gun buyback program that they had all touted as being very successful. They were able to remove a lot of battle, uh, weapons out of that area. Uh, keep in mind also that this area is the size of Connecticut in terms of total surface area, half a million people. My company is uh, a company of 89 men, so it's a very few number of people to cover down a lar very large area with a very large population. But the risk that my command thought they were assuming was that, well, you're, we're sending you to a relatively peaceful area, so you should be able to uh, to handle or, or manage it effectively. But uh, when we patrolled, um, both on foot and in vehicle, we pushed out into areas that had not been patrolled as frequently by the previous units. And uh, we basically kicked out a hornet's nest and found out very quickly that that area was not very peaceful and the the Taliban in that area and the influence from Pakistan that was in that area had basically just um, moved to areas um, where there just wasn't as much of a presence in order to to kind of sustain their operations. Captain, let's take a quick break. Sure. We'll come back in just a, uh, just a moment with uh, retired U.S. Army Captain Roger Hill. He's a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. His new book is Dog Company, a true story of American soldiers abandoned by their high command. This is Veterans Chronicles. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks for being with us. Our guest in studio is U.S. Army veteran Roger Hill, veteran of not only the Army, but Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom, which of course is the campaign in Afghanistan. Uh, just before the break, we were talking about Dog Company getting uh, to Afghanistan and finding more combat than you were probably expecting as a result of yeah. kicking the hornet's nest, uh, as you stated. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be talking about the events that led up to your legal battle with the U.S. military. But uh, prior to that, uh, you were engaged in, in actions that earned you a Bronze Star. What was the events of that particular in encounter? Sure. So that Bronze Star and the, uh, the Combat Infantryman's Badge honor that I received sorry, um, were given to me uh, during my time in Iraq. Oh, okay. And so this is a really an interesting story. The, uh, the command at that time in Iraq, who oversaw all of our combat advisor group, thought it would be a great idea to send a, uh, a primarily Sunni battalion of infantry, motorized infantry, from this area just south of Mosul down to Ramadi uh, just before we kicked off with a surge uh, in, in Iraq. And uh, so we, we had been preparing and training this Sunni battalion, getting them ready to go. Um, just before we deployed, we made the announcement that we're going to Ramadi, right, a very difficult place. Um, everybody cheered, yeah, we're going to Ramadi, we're going to be able to do what we've been training for. Uh, this is a battalion of 800. The next day, only 200 Iraqi soldiers showed up for work. They had taken their weapons, uniforms, equipment home, not to return. Uh, over the next two weeks of preparation and going to Ramadi, a very dangerous place, um, we lost about another 80 troops who just decided to not show up. So when we went to Ramadi, we went to a sort of a hodgepodge mixture of that battalion at about 120 troop strength. Uh, my advisor team went down with them. We also had a couple of advisors quit, unfortunately. Um, they just uh, didn't think that um, this mission was one worth you know, assuming the risk for. So uh, I ended up on, long story short, I ended up on a small outpost called Combat Outpost Falcon in the heart of Ramadi. Um, I mean, we were receiving uh, indirect fire multiple times a day. The enemy was probing us multiple times a day. Um, we basically strong pointed a, uh, a densely populated area where we, we went in on a patrol to infill. We took over a, a block of eight homes. We T wall barriered around that block and then basically called that our home for the next several months. And so um, from COP. Falcon, Combat Outpost Falcon, is where I was embedded, um, ate, slept, um, patrolled with an Iraqi platoon of about 30 or 40 troops um, that we had been training to bring down to this area. 
um, and it was rough to say the least. And uh, the translators we had uh, at that time would not go down with us. They quit as well. So I had an Iraqi soldier who had a vocabulary of about 350 English words. A uh, wonderful man by the name of Haas. I um, hope he's still alive. Um, but he was just so courageous and um, was my right hand man. And when everything else failed, he stepped up and said, I, I know probably more than most of the guys in my battalion do, so I'll, I'll be your translator, which is a very dangerous position, as you well know. And um, we, we fought, patrolled, uh, were ambushed, <laughs> returned fire, uh, lost men uh, in Ramadi with that unit to the point that uh, several weeks later, um, that 30 to 40 man platoon that I had just got to the point where they had had enough. They were so shell-shocked, so ill-prepared, um, primarily because their unit so many people had quit, you lose so much continuity and, and efficiency and combat readiness when you just throw a bunch of people together that haven't really worked together the way that you had originally designed them to. So um, several weeks after getting to Ramadi and operating at a Cop Falcon, I remember going out on a patrol after we had just lost a guy. We had um, been moving down into a very dangerous area. All of a sudden, just like in the Westerns, everything just got quiet and then all of a sudden um, machine gun fire from the roof of a building from both sides. Uh, we're trying to fight to get into a building. We're in the middle of a street. Uh, Iraq is such in the city centers that everybody has a courtyard wall, so you have to break a gate just to get out of the street because it's like this fatal funnel, right, of asphalt and concrete vertically. And uh, the guy right behind me, um, as we're trying to turn the corner to get into this compound that we'd broken the gate to get into, uh, took a round to the back of the head out the front. And so both the combat um, infantryman's badge and that bronze star was basically from um, our efforts to fight back the enemy that day and then to evacuate at this point was a deceased you know member of our unit um, under fire so um, but a, a few weeks later I, I didn't quite get to this point I uh, in the story that 30 or 40 man platoon um, after having dealt with this particular firefight on top of all the other ones one day we're out on patrol uh, one guy sat down in the middle of the street, took off his helmet, took off his body armor, put his weapon down. He said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I said, Haas, what's going on? He says, he quits, sir. And then another guy did it, and then another guy did it, and another guy did it. And right in the middle of one of the most fierce combat zones known to the Iraqi theater, I had a, a platoon of about 30 guys just take off all their kit and sit down in the middle of the street with snipers all over the place and just say, we're not doing this anymore. And that's how my time in Ramadi ended. Um, interestingly enough, um, that was never reported on. It was never discussed. The higher command that made the decision to send a Sunni uh, tribe-based battalion to go police a Sunni hotbed didn't have the wherewithal, the foresight to realize that that was going to be a bad idea. And it exploded, imploded in our face. Um, but that's, that's really, um, I guess that was way more than you'd asked for, but that was my time in uh, Ramadi in Iraq, that's where those awards have come from. Oh, that's a critical story, and I appreciate you yeah, sharing. Yeah. So, Captain, uh, sit back. Uh, we'll come right back on Veterans Chronicles and get much more of the Roger Hill story when we come back. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. Honored to be joined in studio today by U.S. Army veteran Roger Hill, veteran of the Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, let's turn now and return to Afghanistan and, and the mission there. Uh, we talked a little bit about the operations and the kicking of the hornet's nest, as you talked about. Um, we're going to be talking about rules a lot in just a moment, but in terms of the actual combat, there had been some debate about too strict of rules of engagement. What was your uh, thoughts on that in terms of engaging the enemy in combat? Um, you know, to be honest, I didn't put a ton of thought into the rules of engagement going in. I just kind of assume that if we did what made sense that we would be taken care of and you get a lot of presentations and briefings on what you can and can't do but there's always that underlying assumption that um, if things go sideways if collateral or civilian casualties are taken that your higher command is going to look out for you so going into Afghanistan I just assumed um, that as a um, an underlying um, sort of perspective if you will uh, certainly end up, ended up not being the case for me and dog company Let's talk about where the trouble started. You're at this forward operating base, Airborne, I believe it's called. That's right, right? yeah. Um, so at what point did you start to realize that your men were in danger 
because the Taliban was getting tipped off from people that you were either interacting with or at least knew kind of what you were doing. Yeah, so as we, we mentioned earlier, um, this was supposed to be a peaceful province. And we get on the ground and we start to push the envelope in terms of patrolling, and we're getting hit. We're getting hammered. Uh, IEDs, um, RPG-initiated ambushes. Uh, the enemy just really seemed to know where we were going to be um, before we got there. And so we started to build the suspicion um, over time. At about the six-month mark in the deployment, I think we'd accumulated about uh, 25 to 30 uh, wound, um, wounded in action, uh, to include two killed, uh, just before sort of the inciting incident that's in the book, Dog Company. And uh, we were able to acquire the services of a counterintelligence team, which is a division-level asset. They ran a, um, a sting operation, if you will, some surveillance, and they were able to pinpoint um, with incontrovertible evidence that there were 12 spies operating on our forward operating base, Airborne. I also maintained three other static outposts um, with my 89-man company in Wardak province as well. So doctrinally speaking, my own command had fixed me, F-I-X-E-D, um, which is what you want to do to the enemy. You want to hold them in place so that you can go punch holes through them. And my own command had already done this to my own company because once you slice, you know, 90 pe people basically now reduced with all the wounded and killed that we've taken down to 60 or 70 and you cut that four ways, you don't have enough people to patrol once then you've, you've assigned them to an outpost, right? You have to have an element that holds a patrol base and you have to have an element that can go out and sort of secure the local area. And we weren't even able to do that. So um, with that dynamic at play, um, with the sting operation that we ran, the, um, the spies that we discovered, um, yeah, so basically we, um, and also, I'm sorry, this is a little hard to, uh, to, to go into. Um, there, was a, there was an additional sense of urgency at the time in that um, we were receiving credible intelligence that the enemy was planning a large-scale attack against our main base, FOB Airborne. Um, the rules of engagement at that time also stated that if you took detainees, so if you took enemy combatants off the battlefield or spies, which we did in this case by running the sting uh, to the tune of 12, um, you had four days to bring formal charges against them. Um, so this is where our government has mistakenly applied the rule of law in a combat zone, um, kind of like what you see on Law and Order on television. They were trying to get us to execute combat, combat operations as if we were policemen, right? You had to have evidence packets, you had to have fingerprints, you had to um, you know, book them, Dano, right, to get these people um, with formal charges so they could be pushed through a, 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 um, a bureaucratic judiciary system that was non-existent. Um, so all that was going on along with this urgency of a large-scale attack. What ended up happening is um, my battalion refused to come pick these 12 spies up, as was their responsibility to do. They knew that the evidence against them was incontrovertible. Um, and with the urgency that my first sergeant, Tommy Scott, and I had, we decided to interrogate the spies ourselves in order to disrupt this attack. Go back just a little bit. Explain how the sting worked. Sure. Um, there's probably parts of it that I can't go into in great detail, sure. but the overall idea is that we, um, we had surveillance equipment that allowed us um, greater insight into what people were saying um, around our FOB and the surrounding area. We conducted some operations. Um, these were uh, faint operations. We weren't really intending to go out and patrol, but we wanted to launch people outside of our Ford operating base to see if we could get these folks that were spying on us to initiate their call-out procedures. And we did, and then we would basically surveil what was going on, and then we used that to pinpoint who the threats were. Okay. So back to where you were just a moment ago, and that's with you and your, your first sergeant. Uh, deciding to take the interrogation into your own hands, what did you do? We decided to run a ruse. So we were uh, about 80 hours into this 96-hour window where we'd have to release the spies if we didn't have formal charges against them. Uh, our command would not come pick them up. Uh, we were keeping these spies in a, a makeshift building, um, one of the best facilities on our base. Most of my guys um, were sleeping in tents at that time. So these guys were in a, a metal roof, plywood building with an air conditioner uh, with a television music playing in the background um, and we were feeding them taking care of them while this clock ticked down um, with that pending attack on its way 
uh, we sort of huddled with a small group of folks and said, hey, let's try to turn the heat up on these guys because in a few hours we're going to have to release them. So let's get some info out of them so that we can disrupt the attack that we know is on the way. Uh, the ruse included um, open hand slapping a number of detainees, uh, just a couple. Um, these, all these detainees were later uh, evaluated by a medical officer from the division as a part of the investigation, checked out, it's fully documented. Um, this was all done just to frighten these folks into speaking, to um, help them understand that we meant business, quote, you know, so to speak. And um, I took a group of detainees that I knew were low value targets based on the intelligence that I'd received outside of this building and fired my weapon into the ground, which is called a ruse, uh, according to the laws of warfare, which we should be applying to a combat zone, which is quite legal. And to scare a group of detainees on the inside of the building, the more high valuable ones, uh, high value ones into speaking and give us an, giving us intelligence, which they did, um, which my battalion later never used. So explain what happened then. Sure. Um, in short, we were investigated. There was a hearing. A group of us were drummed out for trying to do her job after being failed critical support. Um, the details behind that were essentially that um, I had been asking for um, helicopters to be sent in to pick up these 12 spies. It would have taken two Black Hawk helos, six people, six detainees, and each bird um, secured with a guard each um, to get these guys off of our hands. Would not have been a huge logistical undertaking, especially given the value that these particular detainees would have brought our command. Still, they refused. But as soon as the investigation started, and here's the irony in the whole situation, there were, had to have been no, no less than a half a dozen Black Hawks sent to our FOB over the next two days to drop investigators off to investigate us for this particular action. What sort of interaction did you have with the higher command as this threat was building and you were trying to figure out who the source was and before you ran the sting and that sort of thing? D did they give you any uh, better other ideas on how to root this out or did they just not have much interest? Well, here's the thing that a lot of folks don't understand, especially at this time in Afghanistan, and I believe it's still true today because I've got a lot of buddies that are in and I've been able to communicate with them over the years. So still true today in Afghanistan and Iraq, even in 2017. We, um, we have this thing that a lot of troops refer to, um, and it's this situation that I just described as the catch and release program in Afghanistan or the revolving door in Afghanistan where you capture enemy combatants or fighters and then the high command uh, decides that there's too much political pressure to not maintain detainees. And this all sort of, I think, points to that whole political football that's being played with Guantanamo. But the trickle down to the troops on the ground, uh, this is what it looks like, the story of Dog Company, which is why it's so important. Um, w we were constantly catching people that we knew were bad and then being forced to release them. Um, this had happened no less than 12 other times to my unit during that six months leading up to this particular time. So I was not surprised that that was a response that my command was giving me. And no one else was surprised either. This was very commonplace. Um, another vignette that I think is very interesting is that um, just to sort of illustrate or, or, or highlight this point, we were in a firefight in a valley called Tangy Valley. Anybody that's been in that area will know what I'm talking about. It's nicknamed the Valley of Death. We got a, an SOS uh, IM chat message from another unit that was passing through. Um, we were on another operation doing some patrolling, and they sent us this IM chat message, um, S.O.S. That's all we got. And then their icon on this GPS tracking electronic map that we all maintain in our vehicles, their icon went stale, which is a bad sign. Okay, So we loaded up a patrol of a couple platoons and hightailed it over to their area, not knowing what to expect. We showed up, their vehicles are smoldering, burning through the asphalt into the gravel uh, beneath the asphalt. There's uh, brass casings all over the place. There's U.S. military uniform items, a patrol cap, part of a blouse, strewn across the battlefield. So we knew that something really bad had gone down. Not 10 or 15 minutes after we had arrived, a uh, special operations team shows up on the ground with color printouts of two American soldiers. And right off the bat, I knew something was up. And I remember the SF team leader looked at me and said, we got two guys missing. We need to split up into sectors, and we need to start to patrol to find their bodies. This, is a, this now became a, a search for missing in action soldiers, US soldiers. 
Later that night, in one of the sectors that we were assigned, my platoon, along with our battalion's scout platoon, came across one of the bodies. This is a sergeant first class from the New York National Guard. He was naked in a field. Uh, his arms had been hacked off um, from the shoulders down. There was a hole on the left side of his chest where his heart was. Uh, I don't know for sure that his heart was cut out, but we all assume that, that was a, it's a, a part of that culture, that um, extreme Islam's uh, methodology of desecrating a body. His heart, we assume, was cut out of his chest. Um, by that point in time, we had a lot of assets in the air and on the ground to support you know, where we were at the, you know, sort of the um, Spears point of this search operation. And we were receiving feedback from these assets that were in the air, sort of monitoring everything on the ground um, through surveillance, that there were people in the local bazaar at night that were buying, selling, and trading this man's, the soldier's fingers um, for money um, and other, you know, material. But basically, they were bartering this guy's body parts as war trophies. So um, lo long story short, um, this is something um, that was reported in in the AP, uh, I, I think, in a way that, was, um, that keeps the American people in the dark. So uh, I was surprised to find out that basically a week later, when the AP reported on this incident, uh, they gave um, a name, a rank, a hometown uh, for each of the soldiers that were killed in that particular incident and basically just summarized their death by saying that they were killed by an IED attack in Afghanistan, period, end of story. No other detail was provided. So um, I guess what I'm getting at is that people don't understand um, the level of um, barbarity. barbarity, thank you, uh, that's a tough word for me, um, uh, and, and savageness that we're dealing with, uh, with the enemy that we're facing today. Um, that same valley, and get back to your larger point, your larger question, is a valley that um, we got into an ambush at, again at a later time um, in pushing through that ambush line. Um, so I just painted the picture for the type of enemy that was in that particular sub-valley, which is representative of what we're dealing with in Afghanistan with the Taliban. We were ambushed ourselves in that valley, pushed through the ambush line, killed a couple of bad guys. A couple of bad guys were injured. One guy had his arm blown off. Uh, I'm a heavy weapons company, so we have 50 cal and Mark 19 machine guns. So when we fire at the enemy, sometimes we take body parts off. So this guy is there without his limb from about the elbow down. We patch him up and bring him back. We put a tourniquet on him, you know, um, give him an IV, get him back to base. We send him to hire. Two weeks later, he sent back to me. You know, he's an amputee at this point, um, involuntarily nonetheless, but still an enemy combatant that we had taken off the battlefield, a guy that had tried to kill us. And the instructions that we got from our high command was, hey, we need you to take him back to the point of capture and release him. So I obviously pushed back and said, are you kidding me? What, what, what do you mean take him back to where we captured him? Well, he's now outside that four-day window, and you haven't created an evidence packet for him. And so we don't have enough evidence to keep him. And so the conversation went something like this. Do you understand that this is an enemy fighter that we captured during a firefight and then we turned around and had compassion enough when we saw him laying and, and dying on the battlefield because if we had left him just a few minutes later he would have bled out completely right we patched him up and brought him back and now you guys are asking us to take him back because of some loophole some stipulation our rules of engagement it's exactly what we're telling you to, that's exactly what we're telling you to do captain hill drive him back to where you captured him the same place where these soldiers were mutilated in a previous patrol or incident and release him. So that's a level of insanity that was going on in Afghanistan in 2008 and 9, and that's a level of insanity that I know continues because I stay in touch with a lot of guys that are overseas right now. So politics and process are clearly trumping common sense, as, as you just said. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the political aspect of Guantanamo being a football. What other politics are, are at issue that they would almost prioritize the enemy over your own safety. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> so uh, I think the larger problem at hand here is that, one, this is an ugly fight, and a lot of people are not paying attention. And so one of my challenges to the American um, public, and that's why this book, Dog Company, is so critical, is uh, to call them into action to really 
uh, research and try to understand what it is we're asking our troops to do. And um, there's so many things that I would love to talk about. I know we've got a limited amount of time here, but the bottom line is this. Um, our young Marines and soldiers don't get to pick and choose where they go. They don't get to pick and choose the enemy that they fight or the environment in which they fight in, the, the context, the complexity of the environment. Um, we are asking our men and women to fight in one of the most complex environments um, in history, at least in our history. And we are dealing with an enemy um, that believes in blowing themselves up and blowing their own family and friends up. They believe in pulling us into their own population, knowing that we will inevitably kill some of their own people because they want to use that as propaganda against us. So if we're going to ask our people, and we know as an, the American public and we know as the American government that we are asking our people to go into this sort of environment up front, then when there's inevitable collateral damage and in, inevitable civilian casualties that are taken, we absolutely owe them, um, we owe it to them to back them you know, when these sorts of things happen. No one signs up wanting to kill innocent people. No one raises their right hand or puts on that uniform to do that. The problem is, is we've so mismanaged this global war on terror. Uh, the, the government has so abrogated their responsibility um, to, to management and take ownership of the decisions they've made to get us to this quagmire point in the war um, that they're now scapegoating the, the Marines and the soldiers that are fighting it now. Because what they should be doing is saying, oh, Oh, we had an innocent civilian killed, or we had an airstrike where you know people were killed, or you know property was damaged. They should be saying, "Up, oh, that's my responsibility. I put those Marines on the ground there. I put those Army soldiers on the ground there." So, if you want to blame anybody, media, if you want to blame anybody, you know whoever from another country or within our own population, then you need to look at me because I take ownership for being part of that system, that government process that put those soldiers and Marines forward. But our people don't have courage anymore. Our government doesn't have the courage, I mean, almost to a man, because I really haven't heard any politicians, Congress or Senate, really step up and, and speak in that way, to take ownership and responsibility in that way. And so it just, um, it, it's very hurtful to me, you know, having served in the capacity and having dealt with and seen the things that I've seen, that that, that doesn't exist. So that, that's the challenge, that's the message of, of Dog Company, that's the story that we're trying to get out. Two quick questions before we let you go. We yeah. kind of left your legal issue uh, hanging there a little while ago. You're obviously here. You're originally charged with crimes that could have sent you away for the rest of your life. So that didn't happen. Yeah. You did mention before they, they drummed you out of the service, though. So how did it ultimately get resolved? Uh, it's not. I'm still um, going to appeal for an upgrade in my discharge. There are VA benefits. Um, benefits that are owed to me, I believe, because I believe my service was honorable. I don't have an honorable discharge at this time. There are other soldiers that were drummed out of the military. I mentioned earlier these guards that were just happened to be on duty as a part of my company during the time of the interrogations. They were drummed out of the military as well. The difference between me as a West Point grad and officer where I started my military career basically with a college education, you know, an engineering degree, which I utilize today, um, is that they enlisted with the hopes that there would be a 9-11 GI Bill on the back end of their service and that's been taken from them. So part of my fight today and part of my fight with the book Dog Company is to raise awareness for them but for other soldiers who've been prosecuted and thrown under the bus and had these benefits stripped away from them. I want people to know what's gone on and what's happened. I want to fight for their discharges to be appealed and upgraded. Um, I want them to have what they're owed not just in terms of the, the VA uh, GI 9-11 9-11 GI Bill benefits, but I want their honor to be restored. You know, they've walked around with um, a, a little bit of a shadow or a cloud over them because of how the military has treated them uh, and because of this categorization of their service. Um, so, I, and the other part of this is so important to me is um, because of the precedent that's been set during this global war on terror, the, the over-politicalization of rules of engagement, troops are now looking over their shoulder when they get sent overseas. And a lot of people don't realize this when they sign up because they see the commercials, the few, the proud, the Marines, or, you know, Army of One, you know, so on and so forth. But when they get on the ground and they realize what they're dealing with, there's this chilling effect on the overall force in that they now realize because they've seen examples like my story and heard enough of them over time that there's a fear that if things go sideways and if an innocent civilian is killed because an enemy goaded them into a firefight around a civilian populace, 
that they're going to be prosecuted and put in jail. And so our overall military readiness is suffering. And I am really worried that we don't have what it takes, not because we're not the best military, we certainly are in the world, but because of the psychology and the hesitance that's been created in our force because of stories like mine. So that's another goal of Dog Company is to raise awareness to people of what happened on the ground, but then also say, hey, look forward into the future. What does this do to our readiness in the future? What does this do to our national security? We've got to roll back these rules of engagement so that we can be effective as a fighting force and continue to maintain this, this wonderful way of life that we have here in the U.S. You just said it, and it's in the book. You are not alone in having to go through something like this. There's hundreds from Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last topic, and it's what you've done now that you've uh, come home. And that's your work in combating human trafficking. Uh, I know that's a passion mm -hmm. of yours now. Explain how you got into that and, and, and how you're working to fight that. Wow, I, I really appreciate you asking about that. Um, I've got my lovely um, soon bride-to-be, Abigail Christmas, soon-to-be Abigail Christmas Hill, um, with me here today. Um, she and I actually met um, during a ministry called uh, Out of Darkness, where we go out into some of the um, more difficult parts of uh, downtown Atlanta and we invite women that are being prostituted or prostituting themselves let's let's be honest here no one wants that lifestyle for themselves they have found themselves in a dead-end position and so they're just doing the best they can with what they have and um, we invite these women in off the streets and um, yeah I, I just I'm going to speak a little bit about my faith since you're giving me the time here to, to, to speak freely, but um, the Lord has worked, without getting into great detail, the Lord has worked a great miracle in my life and opened my eyes to some things um, that has allowed me to transition um, my warriorness, if you will, um, as an Army officer, as an Army Ranger, as a soldier for the U.S. government, uh, to being a soldier for Him. and. Uh, for, for fighting for those that, that don't have a voice and uh, just don't seem to have a place in our society. So um, to make a long story short, um, he's given me a heart for these women and now um, an organization that uh, my soon-to-be bride and I are going to start here probably within the next few months. Um, we're in deep prayer over it right now is um, a not-for-profit ministry called His Heart where we're going to invite uh, young men who've been trafficked in the same way in off the streets and into homes where they can um, be allowed to repair all those things that have been damaging to their past and then start anew um, as um, as they've been designed um, to be not as you know they've um, basically been told they have to be so anyways yeah that's it well we certainly wish you the best of luck with that as well as your ongoing uh legal fight. Hopefully you'll get that uh, full honorable discharge. And uh, Captain, I know it's been a difficult story to tell. Thank you very much for joining us. Today. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, giving myself, um, the men of Dog Company, their families, and uh, all troops a voice in, in this way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have been speaking with U.S. Army veteran Roger Hill, Captain Roger Hill, a veteran of Iraqi freedom as well as enduring freedom. I'm Greg Corumbus. This has been Veterans Chronicles.